Welcome, guys. Happy Friday. Yeah. Finally, yeah. you guys survived a long week. Any hangovers out there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're the eBags crew. This uh, to my right here is Mike Frazzini, our uh, chief technical officer. And Henry Feger is a software architect. And Scott McRae heads up our development group. And uh, myself, my name's Jamie Kobach. And I head up talent acquisition at eBags and have been um, extremely lucky to have been able to support eBags and its growth over a 10-year period. And uh, it's been an exciting ride. And these guys are here to tell you a little bit about the journey and the technical side of eBags and, and growth and challenges and overcoming those challenges and, and getting to where we are today. So I got it. Um, just a quick question. How many of you guys out here are familiar with or know of eBags? OK. Fantastic. Pretty good chunk. So I guess that's it. I, I don't have a lot to say. I'm going to kick it off to Mike here. And, and before I do, I'm going to put in a quick shameless plug that we are doing some hiring <laughs> right now. We're at .NET Shop, so uh, we're looking for a software engineer uh, in test. If anybody out there has some interest in discussing, please uh, hit me up afterwards. And uh, happy to talk to you guys about it. So right. no further ado, we'll kick it off to Mike. All right. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you all for coming. Um, you know, when I first heard we were doing this uh, during the lunch hour on Friday. I was a little nervous that no one would show up, but uh, it's a good turnout. It's a great startup event, great community. I wish we would have had these kind of resources when we started eBags. Uh, I'd probably have a lot fewer scars, but um, here today, uh, because of the sponsors, uh, CTA, Downtown Denver Partnership, Chase, Comcast, and Ping, and a special thanks to Pivotal Labs for hosting us here today. And today, we want to talk to you about Starting up with, with hidden debt. Yeah, what would we do without Photoshop, right? Um, you know, understanding and managing technical debt, and I'm uh, pleased to have a couple of other great eBags tech team members with me, Henry Feger and Scott McRae, who will be talking to you as well uh, about our experience with technical debt. Um, so agenda, uh, I'm going to give you an intro and overview of technical debt and talk a little bit about our experience with some real data that hopefully is interesting. Henry's going to talk about architectures, patterns, tool sets, and, and a little uh, more of a detailed rubric on technical debt. Uh, and then Scott's going to talk about our team practices and processes to manage technical debt. Um, <clears throat> so first, a little bit about eBags. Uh, we, we started up in 1998, um, and I know technically, you know, we're probably not a startup 17 years in now, um, but we consider ourselves a startup, right? We're, we're very engaged in learning, in taking calculated risks, in uh, entrepreneurship. It's a huge part of our culture, uh, testing, trying things. So we, we definitely consider ourselves a startup still. We've, we've accomplished a lot in 17 years. We've um, sold 24 million bags and accessories uh, delivered. Uh, 3.2 million customer ratings and reviews on our site. We're really proud of that. Um, they're, they're all objective reviews from our customers, good and bad. We put them up there. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but we still feel like we're just getting started. Our vision is to be the world's most revered bag expert dedicated to enhancing all life's journeys and adventures. And, and we're still starting out on that adventure ourselves. So hopefully you can learn um, from some of our uh, experience here around starting up in technical debt. So a little bit about eBags technology. So all, all our websites and most of our back-end systems are developed and maintained in-house. We have a great software engineering team. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we're a, primarily a .NET C-sharp shop. Uh, we do have some Java uh, and EJBs, um, as well as uh, a little bit of Cold Fusion still, and some Perl kicking around, which is my fault. Uh, we're, on, we're on our third major site version. And as you can imagine, the majority of the uh, project work and, and feature work happens with our website, trying to keep it innovative, trying to enhance the experience to be the world's best provider of uh, bags and accessories for your journeys and adventures. So most of the development really is happening on the front end with .NET and C Sharp. Um, and, and we're a you know, mobile responsive shop. We're soon to be a mobile app shop as well. Um, but we're on our third major site version with two major rewrites and platforms. Each one drove dramatic improvements in our capacity to produce value. But each one was pretty painful. And I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. 
Um, we adopted Agile Scrum in 2006, and it served us well. Uh, and then in 2013, we evolved uh, into Lean, Lean Kanban. And Scott's going to talk a little bit about that process and, um, and how, uh, how we leverage that to manage technical debt. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit uh, about my background. I've been in IT for over 25 years. Uh, I, I started, I've been in the Denver area most of that time. I spent some time in the Bay Area. I worked for a company out of, um, uh, in Massachusetts as well, out of Cambridge. Uh, I, initially put myself through school as a network engineer, or network administrator really. Um, and then after that I was a developer for a company in Boulder. I joined a uh, big, what is now a big four accounting firm to do IT auditing and IT consulting and um, went into management there and learned quite a bit about management. And um, then I joined a software product company based out of Cambridge, Mass. That um, you know, I think I was the 49th person, so it was essentially a startup. I left several years later. There was over a thousand people, offices uh, in nine different cities of the world, and Lucent came in and bought us for a billion and a half dollars. So it was quite a ride. Um, learned a lot about product development and, and engineering there. And about that time, I tried to start my own web company. Failed. Learned a lot. This was this was late '98, and then I landed at eBags, and I've been there for seven, close to 17 years. Uh, first tech person, now I'm privileged to oversee the uh, entire tech team, which includes for us software engineering, um, technical operations, technical infrastructure, and, and, a, and a great BI team. Um, so, you know, 17 years, uh, I, I can probably guess what you're thinking. Um, and maybe next year I'll do a, a session on, you know, what it takes to survive a startup for 17 years. Um, but for now, I think I can give you a unique, a unique experience and perspective on technical debt. Um, I can tell you from experience that when you're successful, the code and systems you develop will likely have to last way longer than you anticipate them lasting. And there's really a good chance that you may be there having to support it and manage it. So, you know, I can, I can speak from experience and, and technical debt on, on, from that perspective. Um, you know, I got a couple of Geico slides here, you know, the everybody knows that slides, but I want to level set on a couple things around debt before we talk about technical debt. So debt is an obligation to pay something in the future for receiving something in advance. The something paid in the future is almost always uh, something uh, more than um, is always more than the something received in advance, and that's that's the cost of debt. Everybody knows that as uh, interest, you know. And unless you're the government or you're you're borrowing from your parents or, in my case, loaning to your kids, there's going to be a cost to debt. And uh, with interest, it typically compounds. Um, it accumulates each period. Accumulated interest compounds, and I don't know if everybody's familiar with this nice little rule of 72 that um, allows you to calculate uh, in your head, basically, when something will double, and you take the, um, the interest rate, the periodic interest rate, divide it into 72, and that'll determine the number of periods it takes to double. Now, uh, from, you know, the rates of 2% to 20%, it works pretty well. Closer to 2, you're, you're really looking at like 69, which is the close to the natural logarithm of two. And if you've got a bigger rate, like you know, 36%, you want to find out when you double two years, that's going to be more like uh, a bigger number, like 76. But for, for an estimation of when uh, you're going to double given a certain rate, it's a great tool. We'll be talking, or, talking about it more here in a second. So moving on to technical debt. So this, this guy, Ward Cunningham, came up with this great metaphor. Um, yeah, he's a really smart guy. He, he developed the first wiki. Um, he's uh, definitely a, a pioneer in patterns and XP practices. Um, and, in, and this was like in the early 90s, he was working for a financial software company and came up with a metaphor to frame the problem of the inevitable trade-offs, uh, inevitable trade-offs between rushing to capture market and the longer term viability of code and infrastructure. And uh, there's a great video um, uh, you can find on YouTube. Just search for Ward Cunningham debt metaphor. Um, and, and really, you know, what he's saying here is the something you receive in advance is time to market. And the something paid in the future uh, is that time which you need to shore up the viability of the code and infrastructure until the cost is paid off. So if you watch that video, um, Ward has some really key points about technical debt. And I've tried to summarize them here. So technical debt will slow you down. 
Uh, technical debt can be good. There's several different types of technical debt, and um, Henry's going to talk a little bit about that rubric. Uh, there's, there's prudent, really what Ward's talking about here is, is prudent technical debt, and we'll cover that more in a minute. But um, generally, technical, get, technical debt is good because it, when you're rushing software out the door to, to get to market and to gain experience with it, but you need to make sure you're coming back and refactoring it, evolving it to reflect uh, the problem domain uh, as you understand it better and even as it changes. Um, another important point that Ward makes is that bad code is not good technical debt. And he goes as far as to say is actually the whole metaphor relies on you coding well so that you can come back later on and refactor it effectively. So, um, you know, we're, we're the same way. We don't, right up front, we don't uh, consider bad code to be technical debt. We, we, we try not to allow bad code. Um, code can certainly go bad over time, and that's, that's kind of a different story. But um, the, other, the other point here is you want to minimize technical debt up front, and we'll, we'll be talking quite a bit about that. So how debt is usually incurred? Um, you know, there's pressure to get, you know, insert whatever product or feature or initiative out now to capture market opportunity, to test viability, to justify further investment, or uh, you know, insert some other good reason here. In our case, we're right in the midst of this because holidays um, are a big time for us and we're trying to get lots of features out the door before we have a code freeze in early November before our big holiday spike. And, and if you take away anything from this presentation, take away that bags and accessories make great gifts for the holidays. <laughs> So anyway, you do the quickest implementation you can, and then you, you, know, you have this notion that, hey, we'll, we can and we will come back and build it more robust later. But you know, I'm here to tell you that it, it, there's no better time, it's never easier than up front to try to pay down or minimize technical debt. And if you're successful, and even if you're not, there's always going to be more pressure later basically for, this, for the same reasons. There's more market opportunity to capture. There's more things you, um, you know, want to test to justify more investment. There's another big season like for us back to school right around the corner. So you, know, you want to try to pay as much of it down up front. So a little bit of detail um, around you know, the different types of technical debt and how we classify various types of technical debt and some examples. So first, you know, we have infrastructure and, and you know, in, infrastructure is critical. These, these are like your supply and production lines for producing great software. And, you know, you need to make sure you have inadequate, you need to make sure you have adequate environments, um, adequate code control, you know, automated build and test and deploy processes. Uh, you know, this, this is easier these days because there's, I know a lot of tool sets out there. We had to roll a lot of our own and it was, it was kind of painful, but we've, um, we've evolved it. But, um, you know, you need package managers and you need, um, you know, lots of automation, virtualization and containers and, and some of that technology helps you here. But it's important that you have the proper infrastructure. Uh, in, even, you know, full stack, even including like the network uh, infrastructure you know, in your, your pre-prod or test environments to, to mimic production as best you can, right? That, that's critical stuff, and that's not stuff that's easy to add uh, when, you're, when you're running down the road. So the, the more you can build that up front, um, the better. Uh, there's code debt, and that's anything that makes your code harder to change. Uh, a big area for us is um, uh, obsolete code. Y you know, being in business 17 years, we've put together a lot of features. There's a lot of code out there. We do a lot of partnerships. Um, we build a lot of software to engage uh, with our partners like Amazon and eBay and Walmart and so forth. And, and we've had lots of other partnerships over the years. But over time, those, those deals change and go away. And we, uh, you know, it, it makes for obsolete code and functionality that, that you really need to be cognizant of and come back and clean that up, uh, deprecate it uh, as, as you can. Um, and then another big area around design and architecture. So, you know, there's the technical debt here are the gaps in software structure that slow work, add unnecessary or inadequate complexity or dependencies, and that misalign with the business goals of the system. And so with, you know, infrastructure and, and architecture is tough, right? There's, there's this notion of what you should do. Um, you know, but, but yeah, you can get carried away with this, there's, but there's core and professional practices 
required for the going concern of software development. Um, you know, use a reasonableness test here. Don't, don't fall into the nirvana fallacy, fallacy and, and make, uh, you know, perfection the enemy of the good here. Make sure you have reasonable infrastructure and architecture, and then you can run down the road and get your stuff out to market. But, but these are really important things that will definitely weigh you down uh, heavily over time if you don't address them. And then you've got test debt and documentation debt. So for test, you know, you need to make sure you have adequate unit test coverage and automated test coverage and um, documentation debt uh, is, is probably the most insidious, right? These are like the, I liken these to the, you know, $10 a month subscription charges that I signed up for three years ago and I don't even know what they are. You know, this kind of debt is, is you know, just in, uh, incurring over and over and over and it's slowing, potentially slowing you down unless you address it. There, it's, it's harder to, um, to identify and manage, but all these things are important to keep in mind and, and categorize as you're classifying and assessing your technical debt. So a couple things about what technical debt is not. We don't consider product or feature backlog technical debt. I talked a, a bit about the bad code. You know, upfront code, you know, bad code shouldn't be tolerated. So we don't, we don't expect that to be technical debt. Over time, again, code can go bad and, and then it can become technical debt, but upfront it's not. And of course, bugs are not considered uh, technical debt. So the simple cost of technical debt is that, you know, technical debt over time is going to reduce your ability to add value. And everyone's probably familiar with this cruel master. Um, you know, this is the, the, the PMI project triangle, right? Sometimes it's called the agile triangle or the scope quality trade-off. And you know, these are the variables. These are the, the variables of how you add value as, um, you know, an engineering team scope, time, quality, and cost. And um, you know, the, the tyranny here is that you can only control uh, or fix one or maybe two of these, and the others are going to vary proportionally. Um, of course, you know, you know, like I said, I've, I'm a manager. I went to management training. And you get a really good dose of reality deprivation and suspension training when you become a manager. So at that point, you can ignore these variables and the relationships between them. But, um, you know, back, back to reality that they will come into play. And, and these, when we, so here's a little more advanced uh, assessment of, of the cost of technical debt. And this comes from uh, a blog, uh, jimhighsmith.com, who has a really good posting uh, around this, and that's where I stole the graph from. But um, the idea here is that the technical debt must be addressed or your cost of change compounds. And when we talk about that cost of change, we're talking about it in, in terms of these key variables, uh, you know, which is how you drive value. Um, and also, you know, in line with that, your ability to maintain customer responsiveness, that red line there, uh, diminishes. And so getting back to that rule of 72, if, if technical debt's costing you 10% more work each time you touch a system, then you're going to double your cost in nearly seven touches. And another way to look at that uh, is you know your productivity will be halved over that time, and you know effectively uh, your ability to be responsive to your customer is halved over that time. So you know I mentioned that we were going to share our experiences, and we have the the data from inception on uh, all of our major projects and major features, and we. We compiled the list of every major project and feature delivered over the past 17 years. We adjust it for, for software develop, developer headcount for that year. Okay, so it's adjusted for the headcount. And this essentially shows our, our throughput um, by year. And it's plotted on a uh, zero, zero based relative scale here. So you can see comparatively year over year how we were doing in terms of throughput. And what this shows is, you know, when we first started out, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but over here at the, you know, very left, we're, we were cranking out great features and projects right and left. You know, we were, we were um, making the business really happy right away, but we didn't have any technical debt hygiene. We were, you know, we were, we were accumulating debt like a college student who just gets a credit card. It's it crazy. And, and you can see that impact it had on our throughput. Like within the first couple of years, we, we dropped 25, 30, 50% in our ability to 
deliver value to the business. And this is very real. And, and, it, and it came down to the point where we were actually delivering no value or very little throughput. And um, you know, the, the, at, at that point, we determined, OK, we need to pay down a lot of debt. So we did major rewrites and replatforms in these circled areas. And then you can see what happened to our throughput, dramatic increase after that. You know, the, the other thing we learned uh, is that we, we did it the hard way. You, know, you want to try to minimize your debt up front and pay as you go because these major rewrites, replatforms are really, really painful. I'll give you a little bit more background on that in a minute, but um, that's not the best way to do it. And so we've learned that going forward, we want to have really good practices and hygiene around technical debt, and uh, I'm going to share some of those with you. But you know, the other probably most important thing is that it's not just about cost and efficiency. It's, it's about people, too. Um, morale, retention, culture all suffer when the technical debt's too high. Um, and it's, this is kind of a self-fulfilling thing, right? Happy developers are going to incur less technical debt, and unhappy developers are actually going to create more. Um, and you know, in addition to that, uh, technical debt can impact the effectiveness of your operations and security. It creates a, a much larger surface area that you have to support uh, and assure and uh, protect. So it's an important consideration as well. I won't go into that. There's, there's blogs out there just on the impact of technical debt on operations and security, and I, I highly recommend you checking that out if you're interested. Um, so tips on how we address technical debt now. And we've extended the analogy here a little bit uh, with these various ways that we address technical debt. And the first way is shopping for a better loan up front. And we do this by giving the initial project, any initial project we're working on, you know, a reasonable amount of extra time, like 10% of the allocated hour, hours, just to minimize the technical debt. This is actually the, when they say give it 110%, that's what they mean. This is the extra 10% just focusing on technical debt that you can pay it down up front and make your life much better going forward. Um, but then as you're going forward, you want to make little extra payments as you go, so to speak, by addressing debt in each successive iteration. And then um, you know, beyond that, you want to be able to make bigger, you know, quote unquote, lump sum payments throughout, throughout the year. By, and, and this is the practice of carving out you know, dedicated iterations or sprints or projects just to address key areas of technical debt. And, and I have a couple of slides on, on how you make those decisions and, and how you communicate and sell that to the business. But again, the one thing you want to try to avoid is the hard way, um, which we've learned. Um, you know, this is the metaphorical equivalent of, of a major debt restructuring. When you get to the point you've accumulated so much technical debt, uh, you know, your only option is a major rewrite or replatform. It's very painful, and your business customers will likely find them revolting. So you, you want to have good technical debt management and hygiene along the way. So how we track and measure technical debt. It's important that you, if you're, if, if you're going to focus and manage technical debt, that you create a technical debt backlog and catalog it. And what we do is for each of those items, uh, we do that. And for each of those items, we estimate effort and impact. And we do it by t-shirt size, because that's a good, we found that for all our swags and estimate, that's a, that's a good way to do it. Um, and it gives us you know, some parameters that we can use a, a pick analysis, which is a great tool for prioritization if you're not familiar with it. And you could plot um, you know, the, the, the relationship of effort and impact on either a kind of a pick chart diagram on the left or, or even just a graph like this. And it's going to point out you know, what, what's the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak, which is the easy to do high impact items. And then you'll prioritize those first. And then you know, you'll, you'll move uh, down based on impact to, OK, high impact, harder things to do will be the next priority typically for us. And those are the types of things that we'll try to address in, in those dedicated projects um, once or twice a year. And then some of the other things that are lower impact, whether they're easy or hard, they're going to fall off on your prioritization using this, this tool set. But if you can get to them, great. Um, and then you know, it's, it's really important to uh, communicate uh, and sell debt pay down to the business. You know, I put this picture in. Because this is this is our this is like what our IT governance meetings are like. You know, everybody's really happy, and it's like, hey, IT, how do you how do you kick so much butt out there? And good job, guys. And 
And you know, that's that reality deprivation training kicking in again. So, that it, so but, but in order to keep you know, harmony with your business team and, and have good IT project governance, you have to communicate and, and essentially um, let the business know about technical debt and, and key points when you're paying it down. So some, some tips there that we've learned is, uh, you know, use this metaphor. It's a great metaphor. They're business people. They'll get it. You know, if, if there's anything they're going to understand, it's, it's debt, right, uh, and interest. And so that, that, that's helped. Um, you know, frame, frame your communication and, and selling with opportunity, not fear, uncertainty, and doubt, you know. Uh, telling them, hey, if, if we can spend a little bit of time in this area, we can enhance the feature set and uh, produce a lot more uh, valuable, robust features in a, in a quicker time period it is a heck of a lot better than, you know, this code sucks and everybody's going to quit if we don't rewrite it. So frame with the opportunity, not FUD, not fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, with, with the two uh, methods that I mentioned of paying technical debt sort of upfront and as you go, uh, there's, there's, you know, in my opinion, in our experience, there's really no need to sell it. This is, this is what you just, just do. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if, you, if you compare this to, you know, some, some other professions, it's like a doctrine of professional responsibility to take reasonable efforts to do things right and protect the going concern of your software investment and assets in the business. You know, by, by taking, say, some reasonable amount, amount let's say 10% up front, like I said, and, and then up to, say, 15% of your allocated hours as you're doing project or sprint iterations to pay it down, that's very reasonable. That's, that's within those professional uh, doctrine um, responsibility levels. Uh, and, and I don't think you need to sell that, and, and internally we don't, we don't sell that. It, you're expected to build software that's going to last, that can scale, you know, if you're, if you're building a, a successful business. And then, you know, those larger lump sum payments, though, where you're dedicating a lot more resources in a, in a sprint or development cycle or project uh, iteration um, to paying down technical debt, those, those are actually very important to, to communicate and, and quote unquote sell, to make sure you have approval uh, to, to, to pay that down, but, but one, you know, one of the best methods we've found to do that is, is negotiating that, those things up front, so to speak. You know, catalog any shortcuts that you're saying you're going to take uh, and, and make sure you're in your project roadmap or governance meetings where you're, you know, with the business reviewing the IT allocation and prioritization that you're bringing those things up continuously and you're reviewing them and, and lobbying for, for dedicated project time during the year to address those things. We're in the midst of a you know, bunch of stuff right now, as I mentioned, coming into the holidays where one of, one of the big projects we have going is a, a partnership that's going to allow us to sell in 150 different countries all over the world. And it's, it's a pretty big project that kicked off in July and there's a lot of pressure to get it out before the holidays kick off. And, and even before um, you know, Singles Day in China, because we'll be selling into China with Ali, Alibaba and Alipay. And, and so to, in order to, to do that up front, we, we said, you know, that we're going to have to cut some corners. We're going to have to make some you know, operational concessions and some other concessions here. But we, we cataloged that. We negotiated that with the business up front. And, and we essentially bought the time to come back after we launch and hit those other features and operational things that we need uh, after we launch. So we've we sort of negotiated that up front. It, it's really effective. You know, when you get to the point where you're trying to sell a complete rewrite replatforming, this is really tough. It's, it's situational. You know, it's kind of like good luck. Um, you know, it, it, then this will happen over, t over time. You know, I think any software system is going to potentially require a major replatform or rewrite, and hopefully at that point, you know, the business has felt enough pain and everybody kind of understands why it's that way, that it's, that it's not a terribly hard sell. Um, but, but these are tough, and, and the one thing I can tell you for sure is in my whole career, and I've seen a number of these, uh, they're, they're almost always underestimated in terms of, the of time to develop, implement, the costs it takes to do it, the stabilization time. Uh, and pain required for that. So these are big deals, and it's, it's the main reason why you want to avoid it and, and pay down technical debt as you go. So at this point, um, I want to introduce Henry Fieger, uh, give you a little background on, on Henry. He's, he's got a great software engineering background. He's been with eBags uh, seven years. He's our software architect. He's helped us uh, do a lot of things, including manage technical debt and, and pay a lot of it down. 
and he's going to speak more on the different uh, types of debt and um, some of the techniques and architectures uh, we use to manage it. So thank you. All right, so I'm going to talk uh, from the uh, perspective of developers, right, from architects, developers. What are the things that we could do? We talk about prevention, so Mike mentioned shopping for a better loan. It's really not prevention, though. I, you know, I, I used the word prevention when I first set up these slides, and you really don't prevent technical debt. Technical debt is always going to accumulate. So I thought of it really more as reduction, right? How do you reduce technical debt? We met a software engineer recently. His name was Steve Brain, a great guy, and he had a great metaphor for technical debt. He said it's like carbon dioxide as you breathe, right? There's really no way to avoid it except to stop breathing, right? So what you can do is try to cut down on emissions, but there is no reduction or prevention of technical debt. There is reduction of technical debt. But it is helpful to know the causes. When you know the causes of technical debt, then you can look at how do I prevent this type of technical debt from occurring. So Martin Fowler has a technical debt quadrant that he developed. And this talks about the types of debt that accumulate and how it accumulates. So in the upper half of the quadrant, we have deliberate debt, right? This is saying, we're going to take on this debt. The inadvertent is in the lower half of the quadrant. So this is, we don't really know how this technical debt came about. I and mean, maybe we end up knowing in the end, but in the beginning, we don't know about it. We're not deliberately trying to add this technical debt. On the left side is reckless, right? This is where you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing in order to accumulate debt. And on the right side is prudent. This is more, you are doing the right things, but technical debt arises. So let's give some examples. So Martin Fowler in the upper left, we said reckless and deliberate. We don't have time for design, right? It's a little different than the one in the upper right, which is we must ship now and deal with the consequences. So the difference is, and it's hard to distinguish, is that Prudent and deliberate is really, there is a good sound business decision to be made here, right? You do have a holiday date. You have a partner that you're working with. There is something that needs to go out, right? And on the left, you have, well, we'd really like to get it out, right? We have a date that we had in mind. We had originally swagged and said this was going to take four weeks. We're ne nearing the end of our four-week period, so let's cut out some unit tests, right? Let's cut out some parts of the software that really make the software good. Uh, so there can be a thin line there, and there's probably some that are a little bit of both, but that's the distinction there. The inadvertent will start in the bottom left. So that's what's layering. And really, this is a lack of knowledge of good software practices, right? Not knowing layering or you know, different types of software, there could be other problems, right? Are you not creating tests? Are you not creating unit tests or integration tests? Are you not following solid principles? You know, those sorts of things. Things that, as developers, we learn over time. You know, some of us maybe were born with them, but typically, we learn them as we go. So the bottom right now is now we know how we should have done it. And this is really business changes or learning more about the business. Right? The more we know about the domain, the better off you know, we make software, the better we make software. And you can have software that starts off great and you, you're like, no, th this is really looking good. This function's going to be great for the future. And then the business changes, right? And then you look back at your design and say, well, now it's not going to work anymore. This design was great for what we thought we needed to build, but now we know what we need to build. That is Fowler's description. I think there's also something else, and that is there's technology that moves ahead, and that fills this quadrant as well. You know, we had uh, great web pages for a long time, and they were perfectly designed and worked great. And then along came a little handheld device, and you could you know, shop on the web. And all those HTML tables kind of fell apart. And those tables were great at first, right? <laughs> at the time, those were perfect. But when responsive design was needed, now you had technical debt. Now how do you go about you know, reducing that, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of the quadrants. So we're going to start off at that lower one. And this is where everyone here is expecting this great silver bullet. And of course, there is no silver bullet, right? There's just lots of things, right? We, we do peer reviews, right? If you're not doing peer reviews of some sort, whether it's pair programming or peer reviews or group reviews, you should be reviewing each other's code. You should have standards, right? Developer training, that's a, that's a big one, right? If you're not developing trainers, if you're not exposing them to other people, then they're not learning more. 
I've been in some small shops and I've seen that people get very focused. They know how to do something in their way, but they might not know other ways. So it takes a lot of growth. You know, individual growth and sometimes companies you know, paying for some growth as well. Of course, unit tests, automated tests. There's a lot of static code analysis as well. There's tools, uh, you know, we're a .NET shop, so end depend and the Visual Studio has code analysis built into it. There's third-party tools as well. Continuous integration, of course, and the big overall piece is architecture and design, right? Where you're not just you know, starting in on the code and building something out, but you're thinking towards the future. You're thinking about what you're gonna build and what we may need to build in the future. All right, the bottom right. Again, it's really good practices. Uh, you know, because this is inadvertent, we don't know what's coming. You know, so all we can really do is the same sorts of things. It's uh, solid principles. Uh, do not repeat yourself. Keep it simple. These are the sort of basics of software. I shouldn't say basics. These are the more advanced concepts in software now that really help you build software that can be refactored more easily, right? That's more maintainable. The other thing is to learn your domain, right? Really, really try to learn the business. You know, a lot of times I think you get stuck in your day, you're working on a small piece and you're handed some requirements. But it's good to know bigger than the requirements. It's good to know what else is happening out there. What, when you know, what is the business thinking of in the future? So the more you know about your domain and even where your domain might go, the better off you are. And finally, you know, do your research. This is very similar to the past one. But really, you know, look in advance, right? Try to figure out where you're going to be going. All right. So the other thing in this one is you're going to add to technical debt backlog. <laughs> I was going to say, you don't want to add to technical debt. You want to add to your technical backlog, technical debt backlog ASAP, right? So when you define something in this area, you want to add it immediately to your technical debt backlog, right? Something comes up, the business changes, and now you look at this design, and you say, you know, we had that really nailed down, but now they want to sell in another country, and we don't know how to do that. We didn't really set the system up to do that. Add it immediately into the technical debt backlog. You don't want to just talk about it with your friends and then move on, right? And then every time you have to work on it again, you complain that you have to work on it again, right? Get it out there. Get it in front of the business. Get it in that backlog. Make people aware of it. All right, deliberate and reckless. Now we get to move up into deliberate. Fight it. All right, so this is what a lot of times this is management. Sorry. <laughs> this is management, right? This is people saying, hey, we really want to meet this date. Or you told us it was only going to take four weeks. So you better do this in four weeks. All right. We're professionals. So what should we do? We should fight it, right? We should say, listen, if we do this right now, later when we come back to this and have to work on it, it's going to take an extra week because we're going to have to put in unit tests. Or it's going to take two extra weeks of testing because we have not completed integration tests, right? So you really need to, as a professional, really fight it. You know, fight back as much as you can. And then again, you're adding to the technical debt backlog. Same as before, right? And, and this is kind of an overarching arching theme that you want to put things into this backlog as soon as you find it, if you can't take care of it right away, right? Calculating future costs as well. This is important to give to the business, right? How much is this going to cost? Is it going to be one week every time we touch this project, two weeks, a day, whatever it might be? And finally, we have deliberate and prudent. So this is going to be similar, we're, except that the first thing we're doing is adding to our product backlog, right? If we're saying that this is a deliberate, prudent choice, the business says, we need to meet this date, therefore don't do the integration tests, you say, well, we are going to do the integration tests, we're going to do it after the date, right? We're going to deliver this software, and then we're going to do the other things that make this software great. Hopefully they'll agree with that. If they don't, it's actually probably over here on the left, right? This is probably a reckless debt instead of a uh, prudent debt. So then in that case, you do what you did in the previous step, right? Add to the technical debt backlog, calculate your future costs. So there are combinations as well, right? And we were actually discussing this before. We actually spoke of a software <laughs> system that it started off small and ended up really touching all the quadrants over time, right? So the worst ones come from these multiple quadrants, and they'll expand into other quadrants as the time goes by. 
So I'll give an example. So we start off and we have something reckless and inadvertent, right? A newer software developer, you know, some bad practices, lack of tests. We create a, a feature that's hard to maintain, right? Next, we have reckless and deliberate. Now the business says, well, you're touching this again. Well, we don't have time. This should only take two weeks. This is a really simple request. You need to get this out there, right? So now you've added, you originally added down the bottom left quadrant. Now you're adding in the top left. And then eventually you hit that deliberate and prudent where it's a new feature, but this time there really is a business reason for it. And now you've added in the upper right quadrant. And soon this thing just keeps adding to it, right? And your technical debt grows and grows. All right, so let's talk about removing debt, techniques for the small payments up front. Uh, I've categorized this as kind of small size debt, medium size debt, and large size debt. So we'll start off with some small size debt. These are small changes that help increase the maintainability. You know, a lot of little simple things, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. It, different from me, the medium sized debt, the medium sized debt typically requires more design analysis, really, it's more thought into this. It does require additional testing usually, so you need some coordination. You know, the software development manager needs to be involved. You need to say there's more pieces than just, you know, a little dev change, right? And this may require business approval. Hopefully it doesn't, right? Hopefully these are things that you can say, listen, as software professionals, we're going to do this work. We're going to say, all right, we're going to do this refactoring. It's going to take you know, three days extra for this project, but we're going to get these tests complete, or we're going to refactor it to use the message queue, or whatever it is that you need to add in there. Finally, there's the big one. This is the incremental lump sum. And this is what Mike had talked about. You saw on our chart when the, our uh, productivity went down and then jumped up a couple times, right, because we did major refactorings. This is the large size debt. This is enterprise architecture required, typically. This is definitely business approval, right? This is a lot of work here. You know, this is a, a big project. You need to fight for it. You need to describe the future costs of the company and really, you know, plead your case. All right, so let's talk about some removal, removing small debts. Uh, to-do comments, you know, people put in to-do comments sometimes. You clean those up when you see them, right? And again, if they're bigger than a small one, then you take that to-do and you turn it into a real technical debt backlog item, right? You don't just leave it there sitting there as a to-do. I think we probably have a couple of those in our code base, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> uh, code analysis tools are great for this as well, right? Uh, ReSharper is one of them. Visual Studio has code analysis. There is a third-party uh, product called uh, SonarCube. And SonarCube is really pretty cool. It, um, has technical debt metrics built into it. I just learned about this one recently when I was doing research here. It'll actually work against uh, pretty much any of the major languages right now, and it'll analyze it, and it'll show you all the points in your code where it thinks is wrong. It's, it's a bunch of style things. It's like FX cop rules. It's also whatever individual rules you want to place in there. It also does a lot of really cool analysis. It'll tell you, it'll, look, it'll analyze a project and say you have 46 days of debt on this project. And it'll tell you those areas where they're the worst. It'll tell you ratios, like what's your ratio of good debt to bad. It'll look for repeated code in sections, and it'll find those for you. It's actually a pretty cool product. So we'll probably be integrating this shortly. So. The bottom line, though, is with small debts is that always leave the code in a better state. You know, these little tiny things that you come across you should be fixing all the time. You know, if there's a name that isn't following convention, if you go and try to figure out some code and you can't figure it out because the naming is bad, rename those variables. If you need to add unit tests because you see a lack of coverage, add those unit tests. These are the little things that we should always be doing. We shouldn't need any approval for it. We should just be going forward and making these small changes. All right, so now let's talk about medium debts. Typically, you want to incorporate these when a project touches that area of debt, right? So you're going back to this feature and you're saying that the business wants to add something new to it, to the system. So you say, all right, what can we take on? You know, let's look at our technical debt backlog. Let's take a look and see what things can we add into this project that will make the system better, right? So there's sometimes uh, we, we do uh, separate software development internal backlog stories as well. And we do that in downtime, so we're a Kanban shop, and when we have a little bit of downtime, the developers are able to go to that. Scott will talk a little bit more about that later. 
you know, create stories and tasks and you know, put them into that project, get them going right away. And there's another one too, uh, if you're doing any sort of forking, you know, flags, feature flags, seam removal, those should go into the product backlog right away, right? You know, you get that project out the door, you know, you're doing a split test, you need to clean up that code afterwards. So that should immediately go into the product backlog, right? You don't want that to sit around and then hopefully later someone remembers it or you come across it later and you realize, oh wow, we're still checking this thing even though we haven't used this other B-side code in years. You want that in the product backlog right away. And hopefully the business will see the seam removal as prudent and deliberate and they'll agree. And typically those are small cleanups as well. So. Right, you should communicate these to the business, but should challenge yourselves also just to do this, right? You need to say, hey, we're going to make the software better. We're going to take three days and do this automated test. We're going to do whatever other cleanup. Uh, and the business should be aware of it, but you should also say, we are doing this, right? You know, tell them that this is a benefit for the business and that you can, you know, especially if you've calculated those costs, you can give them the costs and they'll be aware that, okay, this makes sense to do. All right, the big stuff, right? This one definitely requires business approval, sometimes sponsorship of a large project. You need to get someone on your side. These are the bigger projects, you know, the, the month or two months or three months or six months and hopefully nothing beyond that. There's a couple ways you can deal with this as well. You can do partial refactoring. That can take it down from the smaller to the lower. Uh, I think we've probably all done some things like this before. A lot of times you use those structural design patterns for that, right? You can use facades and adapters and wrappers, anything that you can take off pieces of it, right? Put something out in front of it, take that ugly piece out of there, redo it nicer. Yeah, but the problem is that you're still leaving some behind technical debt. You're actually adding some more as well, right? Now you have this proxy in front. Now you have two things behind the proxy that are being hit. And sometimes you'll have to make changes to both, which can add up. So when you do that partial refactoring, it's really important to try to really add that to your, the other pieces into your technical debt backlog to say, we need to also clean up these other pieces. Now, that's not always the case. You know, you could have some old code that really doesn't get touched. So there are times when you don't need to do that, but that's, you know, the typical pattern. And then finally, there's a full refactoring and replacement, right? This is the, this is the big project. The <laughs> you really need the business approval on this one. Uh, finally, so the snowball effect, right? Smalls add up to mediums, mediums add up to larges, and larges add up to out of business or, right, a year long project or a two year long project or whatever it is, right? And some people have probably done those here. But really, you know, when we talked about, you know, the small maintenance cleanup, it seems small, but it adds up, right? We've all been in those code bases where it's kind of hard to read and it's messy and things are all over the place because no one's really taken the time to clean it up as they go that becomes a medium-sized technical debt. Even if it's really just a lot of small things, now you have a lot of areas that you have to touch. People don't want to do the coding in there. You know, you tend to give estimates that are a little bigger for doing those projects because, you know, there's just a hassle of trying to figure this thing out again, right? And same with the smalls, right? If you don't take those smalls, we were talking, this is the one we were talking about earlier. We have a uh, discounting service. And it started off with a small piece and we did, you know, we, we had a couple things that were wrong with it. And, you know, there's a little, little bit too much coupling between some other systems. The business also was telling us what we wanted to do at the time, but we didn't really look back and say, well, what discounting did we do in the past? And what discounting might we want to do in the future, right? So we didn't really design it so that it would be flexible for other types of discounting that might come in. And so eventually we had this project out there that you know, was tough to maintain. And then the business did start coming up with more things. And because we never came back and fixed this, each time we had a new feature, it was added onto this, right? In the same architectural pattern, and we're adding and adding and adding, and now this thing has gotten pretty large, right? And if we don't do something with it soon, and soon all of the discounting is in there, it's going to be very large, and it's going to be very hard to maintain. So it's really important that you, uh, you know, look at this and try to take the small things as soon as you can, right? Clean them up as you go. Right, I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So next up is Scott McRae. He is our software development manager and Kaizen captain. captain? All right, Kaizen captain. Voyager, Voyager yes. Yeah. <laughs>
afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Scott McRae. Um, I have an interesting story at eBags. I actually came out of the quality assurance ranks. Started as a quality engineer four years ago um, and evolved my way um, into software development manager. We're a pretty small team. We have eight developers and four QA resources. Um, and five of those developers and, four, and the four QA resources report into me. And then Henry uh, and his um, two software architect peers were all leadership peers on the team. Um, so I'm going to talk through these things. A lot of them will kind of be a little bit of a restatement of what Mike and Henry have evangelized to you, but I'm going to actually show you some examples of that we actually do these things, and, and it's not just all talk. Um, but the f first thing I want to talk about is, you know, uh, when you talk about technical debt, we're, we're describing what it is and how you can manage it. Um, but software development and IT, and I guess maybe any function in a business, it's a team sport. And at eBags, we definitely have learned by experience that you have to have a culture of Kaizen to make progress on this stuff. And I'll talk about what that is. Uh, then I'll talk briefly about how we, again, how we track um, and assess technical debt, which um, both Henry and Mike have, have alluded to. Um, and then show you some of the outlets that we have for paying off technical debt in our systems development life cycle. OK, so what is Kaizen? If, if no one is aware of this, you probably are. If you've been practicing Agile, it's, it's a tenant of Agile. Um, um, but you know, it, it was popularized by the Toyota manufacturing process. It had been around well before then. But essentially, continuous improvement is, is how it translates um, into the software development world, but change for the better. Um, and, and most importantly, underpinning it is that um, the best change, or maybe the most achievable change, is through small incremental changes uh, that, in the end, provide uh, large, can yield large results. Um, so why? Why should you Kaizen? Uh, regardless of your process, um, a spirit of Kaizen can help eliminate waste uh, while providing your team outlets uh, to continually improve. Um, an, a huge component of why you should Kaizen is employee satisfaction. I've learned this through my experience at eBags. Um, I get development and QA resources talking to me all the time about um, as, as fun as it is to chase new technologies, the, the most reward that we get is shoring up our existing systems that we um, have to maintain. Um, it really gives a sense of pride and ownership to those resources. Um, and it gives them a sense of completion as well. Um, I'm probably showing my age here, but uh, in parentheses there, I say, what is the one thing you actually have to do to win a race? Um, and the answer is that is to finish the race. That's a Days of Thunder reference. Um, and that kind of goes along with the broken window theory, if you're not familiar with that theory. Uh, it's, it's basically don't leave broken windows, bad designs, um, are unrepaired. Fix them when you can. Um, and if you can't fix them properly, board them up. And all of this goes to s serving the company, because the, the best thing you can do as an IT organization is be nimble um, and confidently respond to urgent business needs. So who owns the process of Kaizen? Um, well, everyone does. Everyone participates. But we've definitely learned from experience, and I'm stealing from Peter Drucker here, if you can see that, um, that knowledge workers, which is the, the people who are doing the actual work are often more knowledgeable about how to improve processes and techniques um, than people like myself in the management role. So really, management should be supporting and guiding their efforts, um, may maybe putting down some guardrails so that we don't stray too far. Um, but our experience has been that uh, from within, all the ideation and execution of improving comes from within. Um, when should we do it? Ideally, daily, um, but at a minimum in project and sprint retrospectives. And we, we do that with every project. And not only do we have the retrospective, but we assign action items out of those retrospectives. We build them into subsequent iterations of work as well. Um, and then review if we actually completed that work. They, it's, it's not just, hey, we jotted a bunch of stuff down in a document, and then we never come back to it. Um, we definitely have a culture of see it, own it, do it. You've got to have that on your team. Um, and I think anyone, you know, we have a lot of passionate people at eBags. And we're a small company, like I said, so this works really well in a, in a small company environment. But it extends to big companies as well. Um, but making sure that you've, you're discovering and evolving your processes so that people can feel this is real and that they can actually act on things. Um, 
Here's maybe the most important bullet of this slide is I personally, as a software development manager, I want the challenge of figuring out how to get technical debt reduction, things like technical debt reduction, into the software development pipeline um, instead of discouraging people from doing it. Because a lot of the time, this is not sanctioned work on a project roadmap. Um, so we found creative ways to go forward with that process and inject it into our systems development lifecycle, and I'm going to show you that. Um, but how much should we do it? Um, Mike alluded to this earlier. Uh, you don't want to let perfection be the enemy of progress. You don't want to try to boil the ocean with your improvement process. You really need to do it small and incrementally. Um, you should experiment, but try to avoid turbulent and prolonged inconsistency. And we're, we are by no means experts at this. Um, right now, as a matter of fact, we've had, we have three teams typically running in parallel. Um, two of them are experimenting with different ways of modeling user stories right now. And, and that's great for a period of time. But if they continue to go forward like that, we'll start to see a divergence in, in our practices. Um, and then inevitably, I get people talking to me in their one-on-ones about uh, suboptimal ways of doing things. Um, so using the plan, do, check, act model. You guys have probably all seen this. We've found that to be really um, effective um, at, at making the process work and just making sure that we navigate through each of these uh, pieces of the pie um, and, and not stay on any one and, and, and never finish it out. The reality is that every organization, I think, has its own barometer or threshold for how much change they can inject, when they should do it, how much they should do it. Um, I think team consensus, again, is what helps manage this process. And of course, with management support and stewardship. Um, so again, uh, Mike and Henry alluded to it before. We have two major repositories where we uh, put our technical debt, and we try to keep it simple. There's a technical debt backlog, and then in the spirit of e-bags, we also have our bag log. Uh, the technical debt backlog is our medium, more medium and large size technical debt, um, things that we can't act on right away. Um, we categorize those things into our public-facing website activity, internal-facing websites, back-end applications, and then the toughest one, the infrastructure and cross-cutting concerns that span the entire technology stack. That's where we have a lot of our, from a t-shirt size analogy, our larges and extra large concerns. The bag log, as we call it, is again, smaller, more immediately actionable um, technical debt work items. Um, Henry was alluding to this one, this guy here. This is our promotion manager. It's a very important part of our business. I'm not actually going to speak through it, but I will draw your attention down to the bottom left. Um, our risk estimate on this was large. Our benefit is also large, but our level of effort swag was extra large. And um, that's a good example of the snowball effect uh, kicking in as we've gone a couple years uh, with this. This is also an interesting example of um, we, we've talked previously a lot of technical debt. Um, we've sort of alluded to time to market being one of the biggest catalysts for it. Um, this one maybe was a little more, uh, you know, maybe IT had a heavier hand in this um, around understanding the requirements and maybe over engineering or not engineering enough. We imposed some technical debt here on ourselves. It wasn't really just a time to market rush. So we use that as input into our pick analysis that Mike alluded to before. This is really helpful um, in understanding what you should act on. This video right here, I encourage you to watch in addition to Ward Cunningham's video. Um, Steve McConnell um, uh, is, is very famous in the technical debt paradigm. Um, great. Uh, he talks about technical debt, makes the economic analogy as well, talks about ways to track it, assess it, and pay it off. Um, he, he does a lot more details, um, or gives you a lot more detail, like if you ever need to justify um, true numbers, or, or at least estimate numbers on what, it, what technical debt truly costs you, there's some good information in that video. Um, again, re, so this is what happens at eBags right here, uh, as, as Mike and Henry have alluded to. Um, in the realm of incremental payments, uh, we, we have projects. And we, for every project that we work on, you know, we can do a full follow-on sprint if we really incur some significant technical debt that we want to pay off right away. The international expansion project that we're working on right now is a great example of that, that we would, we, as part of incurring that debt up front, we really want to pay that off right away. Otherwise, we'll have a snowball effect. Um, probably the most effective way of reducing technical debt over time is the amortization process. So injecting 
little you know, medium sized technical debt items into your bodies of work is what we call them our projects um, over time. And uh, of course nothing can do as much uh, good for you than upfront making sure you're choosing the right frameworks and doing your due diligence upfront on the architecture side, but amortizing your technical debt is really powerful. And as a corollary, as Mike said, we don't consider bugs technical debt, but we do actually try to weave those things into our project work when they're directly in the line of fire. Um, so really important, we're just, we're constantly looking for synergies whenever we're spinning up a new project, consult the technical debt backlog, consult the bag log, is there anything in there that we've been wanting to work on and it fits very neatly into a project. Um, OKRs is new for eBags in the past year. Um, we, th this has been well evangelized by Google. There's some great YouTube videos about it. Um, but basically this is our, our continuous management process, performance management with our employees. And it's all around setting stretch goals um, and trying to do things that really improve performance of not only your, yourself, your department, but your, your company as a whole. Um, so we, in the development side, you get a lot of code-related OKRs. And the way we action those is through our backlog. Um, and, and there I am introducing the backlog again. Um, we challenge ourselves to weave these initiatives into our systems development lifecycle outside of project work and outside of um, production support work. And I'm going to show you that in a second. The lump sum payments uh, that we've discussed, these are the big ones. Um, at holiday time, so November through January at eBags, um, we get a chance to take one of our teams, usually at least one of our teams, sometimes two, and get them to go work on one of these big efforts that's in the technical uh, debt backlog. Um, I'm not going to go through this maze, but this is, this is the framework. This is like our Chicago Bulls triangle offense that keeps us sane as we develop software. But I'm just drawing your attention over here to the, the purple part to show you that you know, everyone has this hanging at their desk. And this, this workflow diagram basically shows you as, you're, as you as you come in every day, you start at the green dot and you work through that. And if for if for some reason you make it all the way to the end um, because there's blockages, you can't do work, um, we do represent bag log work and OKR work in our workflow diagram. And people actually get to this quite a bit. Henry mentioned there are lulls in your cycle, and this is where we act on those things. So. Um, Here's an example of paying off debt um, incrementally in projects. Um, this is our Kanban board. It's not fancy. We actually stole this from the Microsoft ALM Rangers a few years ago before Kanban was really built into uh, TFS. Um, we're still using it today. Perhaps this is technical debt in and of itself, but it serves us very well. And what's circled over there in our solution planning is you can see we actually have some seam removal stories. And this is what Henry was alluding to. This is the way we, we put in feature flags and switches into our code base so that we can, uh, it really facilitates our continuous integration process. We can suppress functionality, but build it all into the same code base uh, with these little switches. But you got to remove those switches, otherwise they start manifesting themselves into technical debt. So, as we end a project, we put these seam removal stories into the next, the front end of the next project. So again, paying you get paying as you go. Um, here's an example of our bag log. This is actually real. Um, again, uh, there's a lot of things on here, but uh, please look at the, the things circled in, in purple. Um, these are actually blocked right now, and this is this is the challenge I was talking about. Um, you can see Matt actually has two of these over in the development lane, and Dave has one. One of them is actually done right now, and what it's, why it's blocked in red and it's sitting there waiting is we're figuring out when is the appropriate time to ingest this into our systems development, systems development life cycle, because it needs to go through assurance, acceptance, and get released. Um, we're not just slinging code and throwing it in production and evading our normal process. So like I was saying, it's much funner to have the challenge of figuring figuring out when's the right project to weave this into or when's the right lull to weave this into. And here is an OKR for Matt as well. Um, so you can see that combination of our OKRs feeding our bag log. Um, and here's our large size technical debt represented on our Kanban board. So this is a full project iteration path, um, which we had affectionately called EOD eradication. Um, and that's something that we would work in over that November to December, November to January timeframe. 
Um, other forms of Kaizen, um, the more you do to tune and remove bottlenecks in your process, the easier it is to ask for that time to reduce technical debt. So we've adopted lean development, Kanban, you know, we, as Mike said, in 2006, we embraced Agile Scrum, or at least our version of it, like everyone does. Then in 2013, we evolved to Kanban, and we really liked the way that we can manage flow and, and set work and progress limits, ex explicit policies in your systems development lifecycle that let, make sure that the work keeps flowing and you avoid the peaks and valleys. Um, that we've found Kanban to really be a, a feather in the cap for that. Um, and that is also a corollary, again, to the, th the better you can decompose your problems into smaller bite-sized chunks, the more you're going to see them flow through your system. Um, quality, Mike alluded to this again. Pre-production environments that closely emulate production, that is crucial for us. When I first started at eBags, we would finish a project in our development environment, and it would probably take us a week and a half to escort it to production through the other merging code, getting it into staging environments. Um, we've redu reduced that down to about a day and a half, um, sometimes quicker. Um, test case management, there's another area where we accrue technical debt. Often you can find yourselves cutting corners here and you really try not to, um, but the reality is tests are what's left after a project ends. So it's really critical. We, we also put these, this type of initiative of pruning our test case backlog and making sure it's up to date or putting the missing things in there. The QA team is very passionate about that. Um, and test, test automation. So. The idea of running tested features that uh, this supports continuous integration and continuous delivery reduces technical debt. If you've got test automation in place that can attest to this, your system's health on a daily basis, maybe even more frequently with gated builds at a unit test level, that is uh, a huge feather in the cap. And then I like to really represent the glue, which is release management and SCM. You really need to challenge yourself to incorporate strong processes there. Um, we dealt with a lot of technical debt there for a long time. We're not where we want to be yet, but we've made great strides. I told you that it used to take us about a week and a half to get to production after a project ended. Really focusing on that function with some new SEM strategies and really making, we, we put a person, we didn't really have a release manager. We did it by committee, but we anointed a person to really run that show. And that's taken us um, kind of to where we are today. And so that's it for us. We put our references uh, where we uh, pulled some of this information from here for you. I'm, I'm sure the slide deck will be available to you uh, in, in some form or fashion. Um, so thank you very much. We automated a lot. We uh, and got ma ensured that we had um, repeatable build and deployment processes, and no more works of art. And we did that very incrementally. I mean, it took us like two years to get to where we are now. Um, so that's kind of high level. I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but. Again, how we got there is, uh, you know, we hit a point where our throughput was really on the decline as, as far as getting stuff out the door. And um, really, uh, so we used to have actually five teams running in parallel at one time, each in their own branch of code. All those projects had to merge down into an integration, uh, integration code line, and then that was further merged down into the main line that we released off into production with. Right now, for most of our work, we actually work in the main line. And through those seeming strategies um, and feature flags, we were actually able to, again, suppress functionality that we don't want to express to the public yet through these feature flags. That's the first thing we do with every new project is make sure that feature flag is working really well and there's no leaks in it. Um, but that, that's probably the biggest thing that we've done is just reduce complexity in how we were um, in our source control strategy and how we built code. Henry, would you agree with that? Do you want to add on to that? Um, but th that was, you know, I remember before I came to eBags, I was actually, I had never heard of anyone successfully working out of their main line all the time and actually being able to re release product every day. But I, I wouldn't say we're all the way there yet, but we're very close. We just need to beef up our integration automation in order to get there so that literally on any given day, if someone said, hey, cut a new, cut a new branch to go to production with, we could do that and feel very confident in it. 
the things that we think we can that are in the line of fire of project work, just bring them in. You know, we don't, as long as they're within a, uh, an acceptable threshold of, you know, if it adds, you know, I think we use like 10% of up to 15% of our project time, you know, don't add any, anything over that. That's how we weave that stuff into project work. And then the bag log gets accessed a lot really through um, actually abiding by Kanban, which sets work in progress limits and, and reduces the peaks and valleys of work. As a developer, for example, when the number of stories hits its threshold, that's a sign you don't keep coding, right? So the first thing a developer does is says to a QA resource, can I help you out downstream? Is there anything I can do that can relieve the pipeline? If I can't, then I actually ask upstream. I go talk to an architect. Is there anything I can help solution plan um, for an upcoming project? Uh, if I can't go there, go into the bag log or, the, or my OKRs. And it, we, we don't want that happening a lot, right? That's a symptom of a problem that you've got, you know, the first thing you do in your life cycle is to try to remove the blocks. But if you can't, or you just have a natural lull between projects, that's when it happens. Some people, again, like I said, go above and beyond to just crank this stuff out because they're, they live in an environment of continuous improvement and they want to make things better. And so I have developers that are there, you know, at, till eight o'clock. Uh, Matt, Matt, you saw his name on there. He's, he's the most shining example of that. He likes to stay late and really work on things that he knows are going to help out his team. And so then what I end up with is stories in our bag log that are done and ready to go. And I work with my architecture friends to say, hey, take a look at this code. You know, Matt's changing some things here. We think this is good for the future. Code review it, talk to him about it, and we'll figure out where we can weave it in. Typically, we'll weave it in when we've got a project that's going to hit a lot of functional areas on our website. Um, and it'll get nice, uh, a good time to bake and get regression tested.